Okay, let's start. Excellent. Come on in. So, everybody in nice again? Fun time? Good to be back? All those sort of things. All right, so today we're going to move on a little bit and talk about so two quite important lectures. It's like they're on a Wednesday sort of fit together. And it's kind of an introduction, a very, very soft introduction to some statistics. And it's more factored in or aimed at why we use statistics. Why statistics are important. I'm not going to throw lots and lots of complicated formula at you. But it gives you an idea about the essence of what we're doing in statistics. In statistics and the role it plays in ecology. Before I get to that, a quick pop quiz. This is not graded. This is not anything that anybody's going to know about. This is just something for yourself. Don't be so often to do one of these. And these are example questions from either a midterm or an end of course exam. Provided if you're not able to answer these as we're going through them, it's a real indication that you need to spend a bit more time going back over the lecture notes, reading the material, re-watching the lectures, things like that. So, now, so who knows the answer to this, huh? <laughs> All right, so ecology is study of interactions between species, studies of interactions between organisms and their environment, interactions between plants and animals, or a nice class on a Monday morning. So, at least, well, let's say any four of those and all of the above. Any of those are plausibly correct, but answer B, the study of interactions between organisms and their environment, is the most correct answer, okay? And that's exactly what we talked about in class. Next up, in ecology we make progress by testing hypotheses about the way nature works. Which approaches can be used to test hypotheses in ecology? Okay, so we talked a lot about the, the scientific method. <coughs> we set hypotheses, make predictions, test our predictions, and go back to the beginning again. So which of these can we use? Observations, experiments, models, observations and experiments, but not models. <laughs> okay, all of the above is not actually correct. Both observations, experiments, but not mathematical models doesn't make any sense. Okay, so it should be all the above except D. So we use observations, experiments, or models to test the predictions that we make. One last one. I'm going to put this over here. Right, so ecology, how do we, yep, yeah, so how do we do ecology? So this is the wrong way around. For heaven's sake. Sorry, this is why you shouldn't do this stuff in the morning. Okay. Ecomorphs of three points, Sigalax and British Columbia Lakes are a good example of. We talked a lot about evolution and speciation on Friday. Ecological speciation, genetic drift, <coughs> hybrid vigor, directional selection, or some combination of those. Any ideas? Who was here on Friday? Hand at the back. It is, a, is it A, ecological speciation? Yep. Bing, 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 bing. Okay, so some of these things you won't have heard of it, or you may have heard of it. Genetic drift, hybrid vigor. They'll be in there, they're not the correct answer. You'll only be asked to answer something that you do know about, but if you have any questions, every time I put this in the exam, I go around to 10 people and tell them what hybrid vigor is, okay? That's the type of questions that are going to come up. That's the type of level of knowledge that I'm expecting you to have on the course material as we move forward and as we go on through the course. So this is, yeah, so what people didn't know, so the different types of selection. And this is what we talked about when we talked about evolution. We can have stabilizing selection, directional selection. But if we're going to get to ecological speciation, say, within one environment, what we need to see, or what we will see, is this sort of disruptive selection that can lead to two distinct phenotypes from one general phenotype. And we saw a really nice example of this in, in the sticklebacks, in the three-point sticklebacks. I remember I talked a bit about these gill raters as being a really important functional trait for fish. 
and how they, the, the length and size of those gill rakers can determine the type of food that a fish can eat. Same as beak size and bill size and duck will decide, determine the type and the amount of food that they can eat. We need to be able to, if we're going to use this trait, to measure this trait, to understand the evolution between different species or understand at what point one population or one species has evolved into a second to two separate species, we need to measure these traits and we need to be confident in our measurements of these traits. And any, sorry, people talking at the back. Hello, if you're in the white dress, can you keep it till after the class? Okay, white dress, white top, sorry. We need to be able to measure these traits and we need to be confident in our assessments and our measurements of the traits. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next two lectures. Okay? How we make a measurement that we have confidence in as an ecologist. And then, so that's what we're really going to talk about today. And then on Wednesday, we'll talk about how we compare different measurements. At what point? So now we want to know how confident are we that this population of stickerbacks has 23 gill rakers and this is 15. Wednesday, we're going to say how confident can we be that this is different to that. If we want to say that they're different, first we need to be able to say how many of them there are. And this is one of the absolute fundamental things in, in all of science and in ecology, as we'll see. And it's a very difficult, it's a simple question to ask, but it's a very difficult, can be a very difficult question to, to answer. How many mosquitoes are there in, a, in an environment? How many trees are there in a forest? How many different fish are there in different streams at different times? If we want to look at, in specific salmon, if we want to look at management strategies for this big program, we're going to hear a bit about it later in one of the guest seminars later in the course, trying to restore Atlantic salmon populations in rivers on the Bay of Fundy. And one of the key aspects here is there's a big and expensive program in place, and they want to be able to measure what effect it's having, what impact it's having. So we need to be able to measure how many salmon are in a river each year. Is this increasing over time? Is it increasing in relation to some type of management strategy that we have in place? There's two types of measurements that we take. Measurements can be either an absolute abundance or a relative abundance. When we're looking at the absolute abundance, what we're trying to say is exactly how many salmon are in the river, exactly how many students are in the room. Relative abundance, we want to say in relation to how many <coughs> students are in this room, in relation to how many students are in that room. How many salmon are in this river versus how many salmon are in that river. We want to know are there more or less. We don't need to know the exact number. We talked a little bit about this data set on the, in the first lecture, where we have the abundance, the population size of snowshoe hare, and the population size of Canadian lynx. And we're looking at how these two vary through time. Is that an estimate of absolute abundance? Or is that an estimate of relative abundance? Yes, it's a 50-50 chance of being right. Relative. Relative, exactly, yeah. We want to know, we're not saying there are exactly 75 links on in, 19, in 1865, and then there were 15 links in, in Upper Canada, Great Canada in 1870. We're measuring how that changes through time. If we want to take the different, depending which of these measurements we want to get, our approach will be slightly different. If we want to measure the, the absolute abundance, we'll quite often use stratified sampling design. So in vegetation here, we can set out quadrats, put a quadrat and randomly placed on the ground, count how many different plants are in that quadrat, then multiply up 
by the number by the, by the area that we're interested in. So we have a field that's 100 meters by 100 meters. We set out 10 quadrants of one meter by one meter, measure the amount of the individual plants, multiply that up. That gives us an actual estimate of the actual abundance of different plants within the field. There's a number of things we need to be, be cognizant of. Our field or our environment may not be may not be standardised. We may have a habitat that's like, like a heterogeneous environment here. So say we wanted to know the distribution of a particular type of plant in this habitat or this type of habitat that contains both both forest and meadow. We could put out a series of quadrats. Count the number of plants, put them out by put them out at random, <coughs> count the number of plants, and get an estimate on the abundance of plants. But here, if we look at this, we've got two different types of habitats, and then our quadrats, we've got so out of probably 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, versus 1, 2, and a bit, 3. 70% of our effort with this design, because we took an actual randomly allocated the site. 70% of our effort is in one type of location, or one type of habitat, 30% is in the other. <clears throat> so we need to be cognizant, we need to be aware of what we're, in, what, we're, what we're working with. Perhaps our plant is better associated with forest or better associated with meadow. So we need to have a, a standardized or a, a stratified sampling plan where we target particularly what we're interested in and build our sampling plan into our experimental design and associate it with our question. Relative abundance, in some ways, is quite simpler or a bit simpler. It's certainly far more common. And here we're looking at the most, most common approach is to use this catch per unit effort. So I go to a site, I have a standardized methodology, I record how many samples I get, how, what number I get. I go to another site, do the same standardized methodology, record how many, how many samples I get. I take a gill raker from a stickleback, I count the number of gill, or sorry, I take gill arch from a stickleback, I count the number of gill rakers using standard methodology, I do the same thing on a stickleback from the other more, and this way I can build up a estimate of relative abundance. But whichever method we're using, we can, we can apply. So in this case, we can say the number of voles per trap night, per trap of night, or the number of fish per net. We put in a net, drag the net through, how many fish did we get? We don't need, we're not saying that there are exactly 75 voles in this forest. But what we can say is that there's more voles in this forest than one over there. There's still things we need to be aware of. We need a technique that is, would give us a, a good representation of what's there. <coughs> a characteristic, a nice way of looking at this is to use, so I mentioned that we need a, a standardized approach. So we need to use the same technique in each site for the same amount of time with the same effort. We use this a lot in, in my research when we do work with them um, for fish stock assessments. We go to a site, we've got a, a net or a series of nets that have mesh sizes from very, very small to relatively large. We combine multiple net sizes into a big long panel of nets or a string of nets, set them in a lake, leave them overnight, come back the next day, count the amount of fish, the different types of species of fish that have come entangled in the net. Because I use a set standard, a set type of net, and it's the same type of net that my colleagues in Europe and the US and elsewhere in Canada use, we can build a large comparable data set of we can use we've got the same amount or the same method being employed by similarly trained people for the same amount of time in different types of habitat. So we can compare the abundance of fish in a lake in New Brunswick with a lake in Western Canada, with a lake in Europe. 
because we've standardized the method. We don't know exactly how many fish are in these lakes, but we can say that there's more or we can fewer. We can compare that between different seasons. We compare it between sites that have a different management strategy. It allows us to build data. That gives us a that gives us an S, that's how we take our sample. We need to have a methodology that's designed to the, the question we have. We need to have a methodology that's applicable across a, to, a, to a wide range of areas. We're going to run through an example in a minute of how how we estimate the quality of our sample. At this point, we sort of got towards, we, we, know how to, we now know how to take a good sample. Okay? We've got a method that will set and will work in our site. And this will give us a result. We'll get a number of fish back from, from our net. What do we do with this data? How do we know that what the sample we have is a nice representation or a good representation of what's actually in the lake? So we're going to run through an example for the net for the remainder of the class. I'm going to jump forward one quickly. Okay. So when we take a sample, and this is an example from salmon salmon in the Bermuda Sea. Survey that was done up in the, the head of the Bermuda Sea, collecting returning salmon every year. We want to know how large fish returning to the Bermuda Sea River are. We set up a fish bath, we'll count all the adult salmon that are returning. Measure them, let them go on their way. We can do this, and we should get about a series of numbers that look a little bit like this. So here we've got a phenomenal data set where we've binned samples into different size ranges. So between 25 and 45 centimeters, we've got a couple of hundred fish maybe. The majority of them here are between 85 and 95 centimeters. We've got almost just over 8,000 fish. Here, so on and so forth. We can put a, a distribution curve on that, and we see we've got this nice normal distribution. This is very, this is whenever you go and measure a trade, and you've got an entire population that you've sampled, you should have, or you, in the most part, you'll get a distribution like that in, in, in the trade. We saw this when we looked at the, the data from the Finke, where we had a massive sample size, 700 and something, beat the beats of 751 species were measured. We've got this normal distribution. Any trait, and that can be beat size, number of individuals, size, whatever, will have a, a range of variables because we've got genetic variation within the population. Yeah? This is a data set for sort of lactation period in pigs could not be any different from beak size of finches, but has a similar type of distribution. Here's some data for squid taken from the um, Bay of Fundy. Doesn't quite follow the same distribution. It's got a peak, it's got, we call this a skewed distribution. It's got a peak here at about 120, and then drifts away. It's got Fewer at this end than we do over here. Any idea what could be what could be leading to this? What could we have, what could we have done that would give us something like this? Is that a good sample? Is that evidence of a good sample or a poor sample? Any idea? Okay, so let's say, I gave an example of a couple of minutes ago, some of the work I do in the field sampling fish, yeah? And we put in nets with different sized meshes. And we put those into a lake, and we catch whatever fish getting trapped in the mesh. But we're only able to trap the fish which fit in the specific mesh size that we use. So if we put in, go into a lake and put in the majority of our nets are very, very small mesh sizes, we're going to catch a lot of very, very small fish. But the bigger fish won't get trapped in the net. Or if we put in net sizes that are very, very big mesh, all the small fish will swim right through. 
and we'll likely get distributions that would look something like this, would be skewed towards a particular size class. So if you get a sample like that and then use your work, it's evidence that you're not getting a good sample of the whole population. You're being skewed towards a specific component of the population. And this is a crucial issue because when we're predominantly when we're working in, in ecology, what we're interested in is the population. We're interested in all of the individuals. That's what we're trying to manage, that's what we're trying to understand, that's what we're trying to harvest. But it's impossible for us, in the, in the most part, to sample all of the individuals. It's too time consuming, it's too expensive, we can't get access to them anyway. So we take a subsample. We take a sample from that whole population and we make our measurement from that. Like the example of counting plants in a field. We don't go and count every single species in the field. We take a sample within the field and we use that. And each of these samples is taken out of the full distribution. So we've got our full distribution. In this case, we've got sort of the, the size of ants. And each of these samples could be one subsample taken out of that. And each of the samples will be a little bit different because we're taking a, a gram out of a full distribution. And what we need to be able to do is through good experimental design, get our samples as close as possible to, to the mean value, and also understand the range, also understand the distribution of values in our samples. And this gives us two, the two components of a good sample. Samples need to be accurate and they need to be precise. Accurate, we could think of this like a, like a dartboard. So samples being accurate, they all need to be close to the close to the bullseye. So here we've got a series of samples that are quite accurate. Here we've got a series of samples that are also quite accurate. They're all within the region of the bullseye. Inaccurate samples, they're all quite a distance away from the bullseye, and here they're also all quite a distance away from the bullseye. Samples can also be imprecise or precise. Precise is how closely measured each, or how close each sample is to each other. They can be very tight, very close, very similar, or very a broad distribution. And what we're aiming for is samples that are both accurate and precise. So we can think of this with a series of examples. Uh, the idea I had about, or the example I used of setting a net to catch fish in the lake, and if we put in a net that has only one sample size, or one mesh size, we could get values like this. All our values will be very, very similar, because we're only catching fish at one size, but they're all going to be wrong, because we're missing the whole population. Yeah, so we get our, our accuracy by using a good sampling design. By knowing, by having a stratified sampling design, by using many different mesh sizes, by using the right number, correct number of replicates, by knowing our system and designing an experiment to match our system. Precision can be quantified. We can estimate how precise our samples are. And from that, we can estimate how close our sample measurement is to the actual real, to the actual real value. So for this, we're going to work through this with the example of, of the Atlantic salmon. This really nice data set for Atlantic salmon from, from Alan Curry, one professor of the department. And this is a, real, a very unusual scenario because we have almost measurements, almost measure the entire population. We've got nearly 50,000 fish here that have been measured. Sample is a series of samples that follows a normal distribution. So we can take this out. And we can take the data out and just look at the distribution and say, what can we say about our sample from this distribution? And any distribution we take 
Well, essentially, every time we're looking at one of these plots, what we're looking at is the relationship between the measurements and how frequently we see that measurement. This could be that we've got fish which are 85 centimeters. <coughs> this can be we've got stickleback which has 25 kilometers. Whatever we're interested in, we should we would typically see this section of distribution. The first thing, the easiest thing we can do with this is calculate the mean of this population. But that just gives us one single value. We want to also try and understand the range of values. We want to get put, be able to put numbers and enumerate this distribution and understand what the value is, but also what the range of what's, what's the spread in those numbers. First, the simplest way we're going to go through how we calculate these in a moment. Standard deviation, essentially. Most people have heard of standard mean or standard deviation. Standard deviation holds or is 68% of the, of the measurements. So 68% of your measurements will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% will fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So if we know what the mean value is and the standard deviation, we can get a really nice estimate on what the spread in our data is. So we know what the mean is, but we also know what the range of value is. And when we want to, to use these data, we want to understand the mechanisms that are giving us these data, we need to know both what the value is and how broad and what that range of data points is. The mean is very easy to calculate. Simply the sum of numbers divided by, by the amount of numbers. The standard deviation. So what we're, what we're going to do here, we're going to run through an example essentially of how we calculate the mean standard deviation and the, the estimate the, the precision within, within a sample and how we can relate that back to the whole population, the overall population. So the mean is very easy to calculate. Standard deviation. It's similarly very simple, very easy to calculate. So what it is, it's the difference between a value and the mean divided by the number of measurements. So the mean is the value divided by the number of measurements. Here we're looking at the, the value minus the mean, divide, the difference between the value and the mean divided by the number of measurements. The difference between the value and the mean essentially is saying how precise that value is. If our mean was 10, but we've got, we could get that mean from a series of samples of 5 and a series of samples of 15. So a series of measurements of 5 and a series of measurements of 15 both give us a mean value of 10. Or it could be a series of measurements of 9 and a series of measurements of 11. Those two samples have a very, very distribute, very, very different distribution, and tell us two very, two very, very different things about the traits, about the trait we're interested in. So we need to know not just the mean, but also that distribution. And the standard deviation is the simplest way for us to, to get at that. So in this case, put it up there. Once we've got the standard deviation, that's telling us the, the spread in the data. That's telling us how, 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 broadly, how, how broadly dispersed our data is. From that, we can also we can calculate the standard error, which is an actual estimate of the, of the precision within the data, how precise each measurement is. And that's simply the standard error, or standard deviation, sorry, divided by the square root of the sample size. When you go on and take further or subsequent statistics courses, you'll realize, you'll understand, or you'll be taught, told why we need to have things like square roots in here. For now, all I want you to understand is what we're doing and why we're doing it. Why do we need to take this measurement? Why is this measurement important? And what does it, what, what does it tell us about, the, about our values? So here what we've done essentially is 
corrected the standard deviation, the population level standard deviation for sample size. So the more individuals we have, the more samples we have, the more robust our measurement is. The fewer samples we have, the less robust our measurement is. So in this case, for the salmon, our mean value is 75 centimeters. Standard deviation, our mean value is around about 80. Standard deviation is 7.5. Sample size is 25,000 measurements. That gives us a standard error of 0 0.05. Great. So what? What can we do with that? What that say? What that tells is if we take this measurement, if we repeat our sample multiple, multiple times, 95% of the times we take that sample, we'll get that value plus or minus two standard errors. It's giving us an estimate of precision around the sample that we've taken, around the, the, the value of each of these. We can flip that on its head and say that 95% of the time, the true mean of, of the population that we've sampled is within plus or minus two standard errors of our estimate of the mean. So the plus or minus two standard errors, consider, we can consider that a 95% confidence interval for the true mean. For the true mean of the sample that we've taken using the method that we've taken. <coughs> so with this, we're now able to estimate how the precision around our sample. We're able to estimate the width of, these, of the error bars in this distribution. We're able to estimate how, how broad each of those are. What that doesn't allow us to do is, is to estimate how accurate they are. We've got a measurement here of the precision but it doesn't tell us anything about the accuracy. So this is where we need to bring both sides together. We need to bring in the, the accuracy, which comes from our experimental design, having a sampling strategy that's matched to our environment, having a knowing what our question is, and knowing what the having a correct method that's matched, matched to that, not having bias within our sample. And using statistics, or using basic introduction statistics, we can estimate what the, the distribution is on each of those points. We can bring these two things together, and that will allow 